Hi everyone, this is Dale Guffey, and these are the quick notes for Chapter 3. This isn't meant to replace using the cheat sheet for the chapter that's found at the end of the book, or the PowerPoints, or of course reading the chapter, but I did want to go over some of the points that are made in this chapter that I think are especially key to understanding it. Communicating verbally is the way that most of us think that we do most of our communication. When we get to Chapter 4, we'll learn that's not true, but the difficulty is we think we do this better than we actually do most of the time. Most times we don't communicate very well. So why is it so hard to just say what we mean so that other people understand it? Well, one of the big problems is that English is what can be kindly called a mutt language. We have, especially American English, we have assimilated wave after wave after wave of immigrants who came here speaking other languages. So we borrow to the point where we forget that words like spaghetti, lasagna, pizza are actually Italian. They're not English. So we've done that with so many different languages over the years that English has a huge vocabulary, but the downside of having a huge vocabulary is you have great possibilities to be misunderstood. Yes, you can say things in English that you literally cannot say in other languages. They don't have a term for it. The reverse is also true. French, for example, has a marvelous phrase that I will not attempt to say in French because my French is awful. But French has this marvelous phrase that translates as spirit of the staircase. And it's meant to convey that feeling you get when you've had a fight you've stormed out, you've slammed the door behind you, you're halfway down the stairs, and that is exactly when you think of what you should have said. It describes a feeling. We don't have, we have the same feeling in English, of course, but we don't have the same term. So English is wonderful because it's so big, but because it's so big, you still have a lot of possibilities to be misunderstood. People are the ones who give words meaning. So take a look at the pictures here. All three squares are what would be considered blue, but clearly they're not the same thing. There are literally shades of meaning here. You know this if you've ever tried to paint a room or decide what color to paint a room, and you've gone to Lowe's and you've stood in front of the paint chips and there are four dozen different shades of off-white. Off-white, cream, ivory, ecru, eggshell, and it goes on and on and on. Here's the thing. Words have two levels of meaning, denotative and connotative. Think of it this way. Denotative is the direct meaning of a word. What you find in a dictionary, think of D's, denotative direct dictionary. Connotative, on the other hand, has to do with the context, the feeling of the word, the evaluations that we associate with a word. Connotative context, think of it that way. Connotative meaning changes. It changes a lot, and it changes between speaker and listener, between sender and receiver. This is where we get into trouble. If you just say the word blue, one person might think you mean the dark blue at the top. You might mean the more sky blue on the bottom. If you send them to go buy blue paint and you don't specify, this runs into trouble. So. You have to understand that. People are the ones who give words meaning. There's also something called the masculine style of language and the feminine style of language. This doesn't mean that they're words that only men use or words that only women use. And I want to stress that it's not that one style is better than another. Most people actually use a mix of the two. The top three bullet points are masculine. I have no doubt. It is clear to me, definitely. The masculine style tends to be much more direct. It shows assertiveness. It shows control. The other three, I may be wrong. It's just my opinion. Perhaps. The feminine style of language, which is typified by those three examples, usually uses more personal language. It shows um, a higher level of politeness. It gives more wiggle room. Now, if you're dealing with setting a curfew for a child, you want to use a masculine style. You don't want wiggle room. On the other hand, if you're trying to create common ground 
and there's some gray area, a feminine style is probably going to do you more good. The problem is people don't understand this. They think there's one way of talking. Women get frustrated with a masculine style because it seems like it's all or nothing. Men get frustrated with a feminine style because it seems like you're dancing around the point instead of getting to it. So these are some of the problems in communicating verbally. So how can we get better? Fortunately, the book goes into that. You want to be clear. Use specific words more than you use concrete words. This is, or, or I'm sorry, use specific words because they are more concrete. Stay away from abstractions. You want to increase the likelihood that your perception is also shared by the receiver. When I talk about abstract words, probably the ultimate in abstract words is the word love. Because there's so many different meanings of it. Do you mean I love ice cream? Do you mean I love my dog? Do you mean I love my husband? Do you mean God is love? Do you mean the love for a good friend? Do you mean the love for a child? They're all of these different types. You have to be more specific. Concrete words really appeal to our senses. The word say is much more abstract than if you describe it more concretely. Did the person mumble? Did they whisper? Did they shout? All of these give a clearer picture. You want to be precise. Who said it? What did they say? When did they say it? How did they say it? All of this goes into being more specific and being more clear. You also want to be memorable. You want what you say to stand out. Your receivers, unfortunately, aren't going to remember your message if you don't really, really make them. Just because you give them good information doesn't mean they're going to get it. Your goal is always to be understood. The book goes through uh, a few of the simpler basic techniques. You can be memorable by using similes and metaphors. To refresh your memory, similes are when you compare two dissimilar things using like or as, as hot as fire, as cold as ice, that kind of thing. Metaphor is when you compare dissimilar things not using like or as. The eyes are the windows to the soul. You don't mean that the eyes are actually windows, of course. You can also use emphasis to really stand out. And two of the easiest, simplest, and best ways of using emphasis involve the use of pauses. Just like that catches your audience's attention and it makes them focus in on what you're saying. A lot of beginning speakers just take a deep breath and talk until they run out of air. Also, repetition can be really, really good. Say something more than once, it helps your audience remember your key points. You really want to avoid jargon and you want to avoid slang. Jargon is overly technical talk, slang is overly informal talk. Jargon is a problem in just about every single field, law, medicine, computers, but also things like sports and hobbies. They all have their own vocabulary. If you use those specialized terms and you don't explain what they mean to your audience, they're probably not going to understand you because they don't have the same background. You also, so you can use jargon, but you just want to make sure you explain it. Slang has the opposite problem. It's overly informal. And again, you're shutting out people who aren't in the know about the slang you use. Also, slang changes. Words that were used as slang 30 years ago simply aren't used anymore. And if you fall back on using those words and terms, you have a good chance of losing your audience. In the chapter links that I put up with Chapter 3, I included some examples of slang. One is the diner lingo quiz from back when, and you still have a little bit of this, but back when roadside diners were very common, they didn't so much take down orders as they listened to you, translated it into the slang, and shouted it across the diner to the short order cook. So take the quiz. It's kind of fun. It's part of what you're doing this week. Also, there's a clip in there from an old movie called Ball of Fire from the early 40s, and the clip is all about... These professors who are trying to write an encyclopedia, they're the seven dwarves. It's a takeoff on Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. 
and they don't know anything about slang so they go out and they learn and this is a clip where you have the professors talking to a garbage man who's come in to try to get answers to a quiz and even though they're using English both sides they really don't understand each other so it's a good illustration of what we're talking about so watch the clip all of that's with the chapter 3 links by the way coming up next that's the end of the key points of chapter 3 that I want to make sure I cover coming up next is the chapter on nonverbal communication in other words how we send messages without saying a single word and we send messages like that a lot I also want to remind you you are responsible for the content of the book the mega quizzes are basically giant multi-chapter vocabulary tests and if you're not keeping up with the reading they can actually be quite hard if you are keeping up with reading it's not too bad but I'm gonna try to get these kind of quick key point things up either in this fashion or just through uh, a voice recording it'll probably vary from week to week but I'm just hitting the highlights that doesn't mean the other stuff doesn't matter and it doesn't mean the other stuff isn't fair game for the test just so you know have a good week and I'll be talking with you soon about nonverbal